Welcome to the Denver Justice and Peace Committee Forum. Tonight, um, you can see we have Father Roy Dra here with us today, uh, founder of the School of the Americas Watch Movement. Um, very pleased that he was able to come for this week and spend time with us and has had several community engagements. Um, and, uh, and we're happy to have him, him in our forum. Our forums happen, uh, we try to do them as often as possible and sometimes it depends on our speakers. Uh, but we have been very lucky this year. We've had a forum every month. Uh, and uh, I don't have anything set up for next month yet, <laughs> but we might have a surprise. Um, and uh, so the forums are basically a space where we try to bring a conversation about issues that are of importance uh, related to Latin America and see how we can uh, uh, build movement and also uh, do action. So. Um, um, I invite you to uh, sign up for the, the list if you're not on, on our list. Uh, we always have someone very interesting and very, like today, uh, someone that has contributed to the historical memory of, our, of uh, the movement and resistance. And also, I want to introduce Gabriela Flora, who some of you already know. She is a former board member of the Denver Justice and Peace Committee and works for the American Friends Service Committee, who is hosting us tonight. And we thank them for that. And I will let Gabriela introduce Father Roy. Thank you. Thank you. to see you all tonight and have Father Roy Bourgeois here this evening. It's been fascinating as people have come in, how many people have either met Father Roy in the past or have been following him for many years and been involved with uh, the work and uh, the work he has done or and been doing things locally around the same issues. So we, we're thrilled to have you here today. Um, Father Roy was born and raised in segregated Louisiana. He then went on to earn a BA in geology and after that he joined the military where he earned a Purple Heart in Vietnam War. After, in the Vietnam War after that, he entered the priesthood and he served for 40 years as a priest, including in El Salvador and Bolivia. And those experiences in Latin America and seeing the reality of what our government was doing there led him to found the School of the Americas Watch, which works to close what is now called the Western Hemispheric Institute for Security Cooperation, as you all know, where we have trained people in torture methods. Um, and in 2010, he and the SOA were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, a prize that fewer that fewer people know know some people know about that nomination, but an even more significant uh, prize from our perspective <laughs> is that in 1994, Father Roy received a DJPC's Global Justice and Peace Award. <laughs> and And Father Roy has had a total of four years in prison for his nonviolent protests. And in 2012, he was expelled from the priesthood because of his support and outspokenness on the need for women to be ordained. I will say that Roy has been an inspiration for so many of us, and you have accomplished so much in the area of peace and justice as Father Roy. It is a great honor to have you here tonight, and thank you so much for being with us. I'll say if you don't mind it. I hope it's loud enough. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yeah, I can hear it right away. Can you hear me now? If yeah. not, just let me know and I'll try and speak louder. Can we increase the volume? That's all the way up. Years ago, and it's such a joy to be back with the uh, Justice and Peace Committee folks and all of you, really. Uh, this is where I get my hope from in these challenging times from folks like you. I would like to just speak in very informally, very personally about experiences and 
people I've met on my journey that have really helped me to get on that road to peace, to help me, to educate me, you know, to start breaking my silence. I, I don't know what can be more important than working for peace, justice, and equality in our world. Um, but as we all know, sometimes it takes us a while to get there, to realize how important it is, especially in these challenging times. But I read recently the words of this uh, American historian, William Durant, Durant. Um, he's an educator, he put it this way, education is a progressive discovery of our own parents. Education is a progressive discovery of our own parents. And I, I've reflected on that often. Um, so much of so many of our actions that treat others as lesser uh, comes from that ignorance. But in my, I grew up in a small town in Louisiana. <coughs> Went to 12 years of public schools that were segregated. Our black brothers and sisters were not allowed to study with us. I worshiped in the Catholic Church where our black sisters and brothers and others had to sit in the last five years. And as I look back on those years, I can't remember one priest, a teacher, parent, or student, myself included, whoever said, we have a problem here. It's called racism. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's, over the years, too, I've also realized it was this ignorance at work. As Wilkerland says, Also, how easily it is today, it's so common, we did it back then, and we see it happening so often, how we use our own religion in the Bible as a weapon, as a weapon to oppress others, to see them as inferior. And how sad that is. <laughs> Many of us as people of faith, we do believe in a creator, a loving God, who created everyone of equal worth and dignity. But yet, we use the Bible in our churches often, our religious, our religion is a weapon, is a weapon to oppress others. I went up to the State University and got a degree in geology, worked so hard at that degree to get rich in the oil fields of Louisiana. When I got out of school, Vietnam was in the making. I was a patriotic young man. I didn't question church leaders or our government leaders. I decided to put things on hold and become a officer to enter the military. Two years aboard ship it was an exciting time to explore the world. Went off to a base in Athens, Greece. Got to see a lot of Europe. And then in my ignorance, in their ignorance of so many of us, they were asking for volunteers to go off to Vietnam for the military ranks, and I, I volunteered. I was told that this is going to be a noble cause that we were going to go off to this country, Vietnam, that we knew so little about as culture, as people. And we are going to defend our country from them, the communists, the godless communists. I can only say that year in Vietnam was a turning point in my life, in the lives of so many who were able to come back home alive. But that kind of ignorance really leads to a lot of madness when you do something like that. When you believe your leaders, don't question them. And of course, 
They encouraged us to go off to war, all members of Congress, with their sons and daughters were not going. Not sent. So many of them got the deferments. But it was the violence, the suffering, the death in Vietnam that changed so many of us. And near the base where I was signed, I met this old missionary priest from Canada, from Bolivia, who had come to Bolivia to Vietnam as a young man, to serve the poor. He was caring for about 300 children in this orphanage nearby. All of these children had their parents killed in the war by owl bombs and bullets. And for the Olivier and his small staff were trying to heal the suffering of these kids, doing what they could. He was the first peacemaker I ever met, the first healer. And as the months unfolded, I and my buddies would go from the basement, go there whenever we could to try and help try and relieve some of the suffering of the children. Such beautiful kids, so innocent. Some of them had been wounded by our bombs and bullets. Some amputees. As my year was coming to an end, I knew I couldn't stay in the military. I thought of actually making it a career. That was no longer possible. I talked to an army chaplain about missionary work, about human work. Being a peacemaker, he had life on the living here. This army chaplain recommended the Mary No Water, working in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And I went and applied and filled out the papers. Later was accepted. I must say, it was something to look forward to. I felt sort of a little hope coming back. And when the plane filled with so many of us coming back home, many of us wept, we were alive, and we back with, with family, friends. It was a new beginning. And um, it was a great visit with family. Wow, it's just uh, the, the hope and the joy started gradually coming back. And as we all know, war destroys, it shatters hope and joy that we all had at one time. It's madness, madness. <clears throat> Those six years in the seminary were good years, really good years. Looking forward to the day. Come when I would go off to one of those countries to serve the poor. I hope maybe one day I would maybe get assigned to live to uh, Vietnam to help Father Olivia. But when I got out of the seminary after I was ordained, I returned to Vietnam with a letter in Vietnamese. A letter asking forgiveness and apologizing for what we did over these many years. The untold suffering and death that we caused. And the letter was very sharp from the heart, and I just said for years I've been asking God's forgiveness for what we did to you and your country, your people. I'm here to ask your forgiveness. And I was humbled, I must say, I was so touched and moved so deeply by their response. And they just softly said, Well, you were young, which you were, but you didn't know any better, you know. You know, it was your leaders. We forgive you. But I'll never forget the words of the Buddhist monk. I spent a few hours with after he read my letter. He said, let's talk. And he said something I'll never forget. I think of so often. He said, you know, our greatest enemy in life is ignorance, is ignorance. Our weapon must be wisdom, wisdom. And it kind of connects to what we're saying, oh, we've got to get educated. We've got to seek wisdom. We've got to try as best we can to break down that ignorance that really is a great enemy of ours. It causes us to do things that we later regret. And we are very blessed if we can find those people, 
can help us can become our teachers. And this is what happened. After I was ordained, I was assigned to our missions in Bolivia. Where a slum on the outskirts of La Paz became my home for the next five years. And really it was here where the force of the majority of them indigenous in Bolivia began to teach the sky from the U.S. and the so people about them in their country, their language. I was the worst student in language school for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke Spanish, they thought I was speaking. I'm not on the <laughs> But they were so kind and patient and loving. When I got time for a few, they helped heal me. But they became my teachers, and it needed me to see my country in the United States. In Bolivia, supporting this ruling dictator that came into power through a violent coup challenge. It wasn't only in Bolivia, it was next to in Chile, General Pinochet, the military authorities in Argentina, and the many in Central America, all supported the military regimes oppressing their people, supported by our government with our tax money exporting the poor and their vast research, um, resources in their countries, the TN of Bolivia, the copper of Chile, and all the other resources in these countries. We were living off of their blood and sweat. It was here that I learned that all the part of the world that the people taught me <coughs> so that I died. Solidarity, which as we know means to simply make the struggle of others your struggle, to walk with others in their struggle, peace and justice, equality, to be with them, to speak with them, to act with them. And it was in my fifth year in trying to live on that word solidarity and join them in their protest against the dictatorship. I was among many that were arrested. And what led to the arrest was when months before I went to Washington, D.C. to talk with members of Congress as a Catholic priest. I was able to get into the prisons there and visit the political prisoners who were being tortured, tortured by their military, by their people, again supported by our government, and of course our embassy knew exactly what was going on there. We're talking about torture. Men and women who were speaking out against that grave injustice, who were speaking out for a living wage, for life, for them and their kids. We were saying after so many years of Boston, we can take no more. We have suffered enough. And they were doing what we would do if we walked in their shoes and lived in their adobe brick houses. No running water, no medicines for their kids when they're sick. To see their children die before their time. From the age of two or three. So many. And I went to Washington and talked to a lot of members of Congress and gave them the names of so many that were tortured and so many killed. And evidently I was reported when I returned and later arrested, watched. I was called in and said they knew that I was in Washington. <clears throat> After my arrest, I was uh, expelled from Bolivia. And I came home, it was a very difficult time. I tried to get back, tried to get a visa. <coughs> he was denied, but so was not brought to But something in I must say was it was a low point in my life. I felt so lonely. 
people there had become my other family. And I wanted to get back. I couldn't. And then something happened in El Salvador. Archbishop Oscar Romero was assassinated and he made a lot of news. This great defender of the poor Oscar Romero. And just months later, four church women from our country, three nuns and a Catholic lay worker, went to work with Bishop Romero and the poor. They were raped and killed by the Salvadoran military. And two of them were good friends, and the their no sisters, Mara Clark and Edith Ford. Dorothy Cazo and Jean Donovan were on the community there in Detroit. But the women, what happened to them, brought El Salvador very close to home, very much closer to home. And when we went there, I must say some of us had never seen anything like El Salvador. Such violence, powerlessness of people. The military were all over the place with their weapons that we gave them, with their training, with the training we gave them. And they weren't speaking out against their poverty and suffering, saying we can't make it on a dollar a day picking those coffee beans in the field. They were seen as an enemy, but they were the enemy. And like Bishop Romero, who tried to defend them, he too was killed. Their loved ones killed. They didn't know. They could not go to anyone. It reminded me, uh, I mean, I was, I was as frightened in El Salvador as I was in Vietnam. I mean, I was just, we came back, I remember, from our time in, in El Salvador. And we knew that we couldn't be silent. We had to speak. And many of us did different things. <coughs> When we learned that 525 Salvadoran soldiers were being trained at Fort Benning, Georgia. That was just before the School of the Americas came in. I know this right there to say not in our name. We formed a group there in Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, home of Fort Benning. And we started having meetings, started gathering at the main gate of Fort Benning calling attention to what's going on in El Salvador, stop the killing. We spoke in different colleges there, tried to get in a few churches, some of them allowed us, others did. And there was so much ignorance about, about, about El Salvador, so many just didn't know what was going on. They weren't on all delegations that went to El Salvador. They didn't talk to the people. They didn't hear their stories about their suffering and death of their loved ones. After many talks, we decided that it was time to act. And three of us from our solidarity group, Linda Venter Media, who was in the Army Reserves, Larry Rosebaum, an oblate priest who had worked with in Brazil, he was from Chicago. He was later killed in Guatemala. <coughs> but the three of us, dressed as high-ranking army officers, and we went on to Fort Benning at night. We had with us the powerful boom box. And in that tape player was the last sermon of Bishop Oscar Romero that he gave in the cathedral in San Salvador the day before he was assassinated, where he made his he said, special plea, I have a special plea for the military. Lay down your weapons. Stop the killing. Stop killing your fellow campesinos, your brothers and sisters. And obey a higher law. <coughs> that law of God that says, thou shalt not kill. It was the next day that he was assassinated. 
Bishop Romero's did say before he was killed, he knew death was near close. He was coming. He had so many death threats. He said, you can kill me, but my, my words will live on. I cannot be silenced and how true it is. And we took the words of this prophet, this smart Oscar Romero, down to Fort Benning at night and climbed this tall pine tree near the barracks where the 525 Salvadorans were housed. And when the last lights went out, we said, Bishop Romero, this is for you, brother. And his voice just moved into the barracks. We saw this as a very sacred moment. They didn't quite see it that way. <laughs> they came out of the barracks with their M16s and had German shepherds, the MPs, the trainers. They were angry. But the light saw us. Orders are now from the tree, are they going to shoot us down? It was time to come down. They brought in the FBI and questioned us for a few hours. And the jungle fatigues that we were wearing, we just had, as the, as the military last name. And I read the name of Brian Dan Jesuit that was killed there in El Salvador. Priest from only 32 killed. Then they had the name of Jane Donovan, representing Jean Donovan, one of the four church women killed. And I had the name of Merrill. And when they questioned us, we just gave them that name. And said, you should know us. You were responsible for our death in El Salvador. They knew what we were talking about. We were brought to jail and then to trial and then to Prison. I want to mention something. I think there are many of us in the struggle for peace and justice. You have to deal with something that's really important. Our family members, our loved ones, friends. Often they don't have the experience or that you might have and don't understand what you're doing. I know it's very hard in my family in Louisiana, small town. They have never been to El Salvador, nor did Linda's parents, so father was a career military officer. Lara's friends had problems with what we did. The nonviolent civil disobedience, breaking the law, the fire of the father higher law. It's not easy. And often it keeps us from living out what we have to do, rooted in our experiences. And I just want to say, I and others have learned that our loved ones is hard, it's hard, but it's not about them. It's not about them. It's about solidarity with others. But the good news so often, our loved ones, friends who are angry or upset, they might, they might think we're embarrassing them by our actions, going to prison, protesting. But slowly but surely, so often, they begin to realize that what we are doing is rooted in our experience, and often they will break their silence. But if not, it's that thing we call love, Unconditional love. It was so wonderful, such a blessing to get that from my own family, very traditional, hardworking people. And I'll never forget serving that woman who had been sent to prison for a year and a half, and I'll never forget when they visited me in prison. It was after many months. My mother prison saying to me that why are there more protesters in prison? <laughs> Could you say that again? <laughs> no, we've got to follow our conscience. We've got to do what we have to do to be true.
true to ourselves, to sleep at night, to be true to that word solidarity. And uh, but so often we have to deal with other issues as we know. Prison was like a long retreat for regrets. We knew why we were there. And we learned something very important from all those great peacemakers before us. So many great peacemakers who taught us you can imprison us, but you can silence us. And it's so different from a prison in Bolivia. They had no access to the Wow. Or in El Salvador. But here in the United States, we had access, access to so many media interviews reporters from newspapers. And then I had friends send me the addresses of 25 of the top, the biggest newspapers in the country, along with magazines. And I and Larry did the same thing. We wrote hundreds of letters to the media. I even those letters from prison explain why we are here, calling attention to El Salvador and what our country is doing to the people of El Salvador with our tax fund, <coughs> suffering the death we're causing. And it was brought great joy when I was able to get my letter in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times and the Boston Globe and others. It just made you feel, yes, the word is getting out. It's spreading. We all got a, and Laura and I got out of prison in good shape. And we had many friends in our prisons with fellow inmates. Many of them, some of them were in El Salvador, from El Salvador, most of them, most of them in, in prison for drug, long sentences, 15, 20 years. We were doing a year and a half, we were short times. <coughs> We went back to work, doing solidarity work, and then not long after being out of prison, something happened once again in El Salvador. They went out to the Jesuits at their university and were educating so many about what was going on in El Salvador. The military entered, in, entered their university after midnight dragging these six Jesuits out of their rooms with them, their co-worker, young, young mother, Elma, and her teenage daughter, Selena. And they were, massive, they were shot at close range along the way. And this made the front pages, it was all over the world. The Jesuits, as you know, <coughs> had a lot of influence. The British University here in town, one of the 19 universities throughout the country, many high schools. And in other countries, the Jesuits are well known as educators. Members of Congress were very angry after the massacre. They knew a couple of the Jesuits. Or they had gone to Georgetown or other Jesuit schools. They sent a congressional task force to investigate. It was headed by Representative Joseph Monkley from Massachusetts, who became a real good friend and ally of ours. But they returned from their investigation of the massacre and reported that those responsible were trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benny, Georgia. When I read that, I realized this is important. I've got to go back to Fort Benny. I called the headquarters, the Merino headquarters in New York. I was based in Merino, work out of the in Minneapolis. And got their support and went down and started organizing, calling friends to join me. And we started with a group of 10, 10 of us, a Jesuit, two Dominican priests, three Salvadorans who had to flee El Salvador with death threats, Kathy Kelly from Chicago, a well-known activist, 
Jordan didn't give me no medal and recipient of the Medal of Honor came. We had a group of ten. For three days we just reflected, talked, and we were in an We began, we decided on a very serious, fast, a hunger strike right into the main gate of Fort Benning. Walked wrong game. That went 35 days. It was hard, it was hard, but our fast was optional. We could end it at any time. We were very aware that so many of our brothers and sisters in these countries, like El Salvador, they fast every day. They don't have an option. They can't end it. We can't. And we held banners. Close the school of the Americans. We knew the basics of it. Just the basics. And so graduates of that school, a military school, combat school that was trained militaries from 25 different countries throughout Latin America. Over 50,000 of them had gone to that school and caused untold suffering and death to our people. And it was all paid for by our taxes. It was done in our name. In our name. Five days. We built a nice community during that time. Every afternoon around five o'clock, people started joining us. We camped out at the main gate. And they would bring their music, their poetry, their thoughts. And it, it, it was wonderful. It was really very life giving. But after the fast, we realized we just knew the basics. We had to get to work. We had to do some research. And what we discovered was just incredible. And this school had been hiding behind a wall of secrecy for many years. It, it originated in Panama, way we, we back in the 1940s. It was kicked out of Panama in 19... And quietly settled in Fort Benning, Georgia. They had been there for some years until we found out about it in 1990. It was a combat school. We also learned that there were techniques of torture that was taught to select individuals from their militaries. <coughs> Most of the soldiers were coming from Colombia and El Salvador. Honduras. A friend of ours was able to get into the SOA library, the archives, and give us a lot of information that was very important. Uh, people in the military who were able to get access to that information that really helped us. And I and others started taking the research that others were doing the basics in taking it around the country, into colleges, churches, peace groups. And then we realized something very important. It's important to us. We knew enough among the school. This was a school of assassins, a school of dictators. Let's gather here every November and keep alive the memories of the victims. And we put the word out. We opened up a small office in Washington, D.C. We started our website, soaw.org. And people started to come. First, a couple hundred. And then a thousand. And then 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 over the years. And I cannot express the joy that I would feel just to see so many people coming from all over the country colleges, high schools, lots of nuns, a lot of senior citizens, parents came with their children, and we had also, we had um, a lot of labor leaders, labor workers, United Auto Workers came, really encouraged to come by there. 
United Auto Workers President Bob King, a friend of ours. Assassins, the Washington Post, the School for Dictators. 
and all these other big papers like the Boston Globe, the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, in Atlanta Constitution, all calling for the school's closure in their editorials. And it led to really the name change, the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security and Cooperation. <coughs> Four years ago, as things began really to heat up on the, the border, as we know, we made a big decision after years of discernment. We decided to go to the border. Nogales, Arizona, outside of Tucson, to express our love and solidarity with our migrant sisters and brothers who are fleeing. And realize that, that connection to those many years of at School of the Americas in the training of those thousands of soldiers that contributed to that violence over the years that caused people to flee. And of course, our U.S. economic policies <coughs> that lead to so much poverty, exploiting the, the poor, enriching ourselves for their cheap labor, our corporations, and the greed that's at the very core of our economic policies and very, very important is the issue of course along with militarism, the issue of racism, racism, and the cruelty, the cruelty of it all. We will continue to be going, of course, to the border to express our solidarity. This year is the 10th anniversary, I'm sorry, the 30th anniversary of the massacre of the six Jesuits and the two women in El Salvador. We made a decision to go to uh, Fort Benning this year, November the 16th and 17th, that weekend. Check your calendar. It would be wonderful to have you with us. And um, but this coming year, of course, we're going to be back at the border. Our movement, like many movements, are going through challenging times, like the committee. We've been at, been at this for 28 years. And other movements, like the Men of Justice and Peace Committee, longer than us. And all is in challenging times. It's not hard to keep up the numbers, the membership, the funding. But we keep it our hands on the plow. Sure. And this year we'll be back in small with smaller numbers, but with the same spirit of solidarity. Later, go to our website, soaw.org, for more information. Let me just stay in closing just for a couple of minutes from me, my situation personally what happened to me and my community. For 25 years, it was a full time talking about U.S. foreign policy, the injustice of the School of the Americas, and our support of that school and what it was doing to so many. And I began in so many of my talks years later to meet these very devout Catholic women, highly educated, who said, we've got to talk. There's a problem. When are you going to address this injustice in your church and how women are treated? Of course, I realized I was in a profession that only men could belong to. It's an all-male priesthood, the patriarchy of the Catholic Church. And what I was hearing kept me awake at night. What they were saying was so true that there was a problem, just as there was a problem in Louisiana with racism, there's a problem in the Catholic Church with sexism. And I began to ask just a basic question that started to get me in trouble. Who are we as men to say that, that our call from God is authentic, but the call of these women is not? Mm. <coughs> do, not the, do not we as Catholic priests and patriarch in the church teach that an all loving God created every one of equal worth in Dignity. That includes women. Amen. <laughs> and what really bothered me was to be very aware 
as a priest for 40 years. And I belong to a profession that women could not apply for. And so wherever I went, I spoke about the School of the Americas, the injustice there, and I spoke about the injustice in the Catholic Church. And I started getting calls from bishops from the headquarters. And then a, a turning point came when I was invited to Rome to give a big talk to about 400 Catholic priests and nuns about the School of the Americas in U.S. foreign policy in Rome. And that went very well, that talk. I regret, though, that I did not bring up at that conference the issue of women priests that issue discrimination against women. And it kept me awake at night. It was it the fear? I didn't do it, but the next day, I got an invitation to speak at Vatican Radio. 15-minute live interview that was going out to a much bigger audience in four languages throughout Europe. And, uh, I knew what I had to do then. I would not be signed like the day before. Amen. And um, everything went well for 13 minutes as I spoke about this. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just put it out there. There will never be justice in the Catholic Church until women can be ordained. This all male priesthood is rooted in sexism. What about the church teaching I asked that call that says, that professes that God created us all equal, of equal worth and dignity? And I asked that question on Vatican Radio, who are we as men? To say that our call from our all women God is authentic. The call of women is not. And after that question, the manager of the radio came in and cut me off the air. They started playing this Gregorian chant. <laughs> I have to tell you, it was too late. I have to tell you, I slept very well that night. <laughs> when I came back to Georgia, the phone call was waiting from the headquarters. I had been reported this was serious. And all they said, the headquarters said to me, you better watch yourself. They are watching me very closely. I could not be silenced about the School of the Americas. And I certainly was not going to be silent about the equality of women in the church and their ordination. And after attending the ordination of a woman in Mexico, Kentucky, one of the many devout Catholic women being ordained, not recognized by Rome, by the Vatican. I got this very important, um, very serious letter from the Vatican, simply stating that I was causing scandal in the church by my supporting women priest, and that I had 30 days to recant, I would be expelled from the priesthood. I went off for a week to a monastery, worked on my response and simply so said what you're asking of me would, would, would really violate my conscience. You are asking me to lie and to say something that I do not believe in. I will not recant. And I could not resist from saying that when Catholics hear the word scandal, they do not think about the ordination of <laughs> 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 Majority of Catholics, 75% according to the orders, Gallup Times and others in the Times, support the ordination of women. But they think about all the thousands of Catholic priests, I and mean, that was years ago, like this. Thousands of Catholic priests, every age of abuse, thousands of children. While bishops covered up their horrific crimes. Send that letter off and 30 days passed, I didn't hear anything, and the month
on some food. I got a can of oil and um, helped prepare my defense, prepared, and had some discussions with my very old community due process, as we call it. And I must say I was very discouraged, though. I was very baffled by the lack of support from my fellow priest. Some longtime friends did say that they supported me, but they couldn't go public. They were very fearful that they too would be expelled. What I began to realize is something very important. That at the very core of this issue is power. Power. And it begins, this addiction to power begins in the seminary as I look back. We're welcome friends. Some of us were in love with women before going to the seminary and know that they would probably need better priests than us. But something happens in those years of training. They start telling us that we're somehow consecrated ones. And we as men are chosen and called to do something that women cannot do. This is absurd. Amen. This is absurd. Amen. This is heresy at its worst. This defies logic. And then when automation comes, that's when you really put on the pedestal. That's when the real addiction starts really taking hold. And in very subtle ways, we start believing what we were taught, that somehow we're special, what we're doing, we're the consecrated ones. And that what we're doing, women cannot do. It's addiction. And like most addictions, we will deny it. In this case, we call it addiction to power. Power. And all I can say is that when the letter came, the final letter came from the Vatican, expelling me from the priesthood after 40 years, I thought I was prepared, but I wasn't. I thought that my community, who had always supported me in going to prison for four years, always supported our work in the Asuri Watch, came from the nuns, the priests, some of the spirits came down to the vigil who visit us in prison. They put out $60,000 for a documentary about the school of the Americas called School of, school of Assassins. That documentary got an Oscar nomination and went out to about 60,000 people. It really helped spread the word. It really, that documentary, funded by my community, brought so many more people into the movement. And it just baffled me. I was somewhat baffled and shocked that they would not support the issue of gender equality. This injustice. And when I began to realize that there was this addiction that and somehow they couldn't. This addiction to power. Not only in the church, but in many other professions. All I can say is that it was, it's been a difficult all going through several experiences. And there's anger, sadness. I've never experienced this kind of rejection in my life hurt and pain and just I, I was disappointed with myself. I thought I decided as I could convince so many people about the story of the Americas and how important it is to close it. I, I was disappointed in myself that I couldn't convince my fellow priests to support the automation of women. And I've come to something and the anger is still there. I don't a lot of it and the disappointment. I realized something very important. There will be consequences when we follow the conscience. When we get involved in issues just like the School of the Americas, when we walk in solidarity with our sisters and brothers of Latin America and other countries, when we try and walk in solidarity with people in our faith communities because of the way they are treated. There are consequences, and this was a big one. 
And I realize I have no regrets. As difficult as it's been, no regrets. Amen. This experience has given me a glimpse, just a glimpse, of what millions and millions of people go through every day in Latin America and throughout the world, here at home, in our communities. Because, because of their race, because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation and identity. Incredible. And what I've come to is no regrets and what I want to do really, I feel more committed than ever before to keep working like you for peace and justice and equality. And I just want to end with the words of uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero, who said not long before he was assassinated, talking about consequences, about breaking one's silence. So many who have given their lives for the cause. But they inspire us. They are present often when we do things that we feel afraid to do. But the words of Bishop Romero, he said, you know, in this struggle for peace and justice and equality, we can all do something. We can all do something. And we can do it well. And that's where we come in. And that's where I'm uh, then the Justice and Peace Center, that, you know, all of you have been a part of that, SOA Watch and other organizations and um, here in Denver and throughout the country and the world, uh, we're trying to do that. And I feel, especially now in these very, very challenging times, we've got work ahead of us. Um, but let me just stop there. Thank you. I, uh uh, spoke with you earlier and mentioned that I heard you speak 25 years ago at uh, Spirit of Christ, I believe it's called, in Arvada. Um, <coughs> I wondered if, um, if you ever thought about tempering your grief about being defrocked with uh, considering the Episcopal tradition or the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Yeah, I, I thought about that, actually. I went into other faith communities. But I don't know, I, I just felt, um, let me put it this way, I, I never did like movies. Nobody likes a movie. Nobody but likes a bully. Nobody likes a bully. Oh, I, a bully, I, I yes, yes. I see yeah. my church that I was a part of for so many years. Yeah. Doing good things in many ways. I mean, it brought me a Catholic priest in Vietnam. There are many good aspects of them. Not everyone is so addicted to power. This priest certainly wasn't. It was he who really brought me, because I was just a Sunday Catholic, not even a Sunday Catholic. But I just feel, I thought, I just to just say I, I just feel that Problem is abuse of power. That's what bullies do. They abuse their power. And the core of this issue that led to my being expelled is, is, it, is power. And so I, I made a decision after much thought, other sleepless nights, and a few margaritas. <laughs> it's always helpful. <laughs> that, that, no, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. In fact, this coming year, I, I was, let me just, something important. Many of us are you know, went to the embassy, U.S. Embassy in La Paz, which got me in trouble. Uh, got my friends in Bolivia in trouble, but we would go to the U.S. Embassy in La Paz, Bolivia to protest. I mean, it was that symbol of U.S power. It was a symbol of such suffering and death and brutality and oppression. It was what the U.S. was doing to their people, 
to the people there in support of their dictatorship, and it was a good place to put on feet. And I remember we went to um, the U.S. Embassy years later in Honduras, and were arrested there. We had nine of us who organized the protest there. And we slept on the steps. They shut, they shut down the embassy. We were able to shut it down. The next day, the military moved in. Said, I'm during the military. And arrested us and actually expelled us from the country and paid our airfare. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we got arrested not long ago at the El Salvador embassy in Washington, D.C. El Salvador's embassy in Washington. And I remember we got arrested there, seven of us. And uh, because of what, what they were doing in El Salvador, Salvadoras. And we were brought to trial, and it was good. We got a lot of press. We were ready to go to jail. But they, they uh, acquitted us. And then I remember a few years ago, this is actually part of before I really got introduced to the Women's Organization, I was invited by over 100 women in the Women's Organization Conference to go in front of the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C. and to deliver a petition of 35,000 Catholics and calling for gender equality in the Catholic Church. And I joined them, inviting me to go, and I went with the color. And I remember joining them to the main, you know, the, the entrance of the Vatican. And of course, that got me in a little trouble. But I realized, oh, I, I'll never forget my, what I felt when I was there. In front, as a guy, in front of the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C. It was even more powerful than, in a way, because of being pre one of these other embassies. And I remember when I went to Washington, and said, to walk to, for meetings, I was always watch meetings and other meetings. On the ships. I would extend my stay and go in front of the Vatican Embassy by myself, by myself, solitary witness. And I held two bands. One man said, ordained women. And the other man said, God created us all equal. Straight and gay. And I remember the woman, just I felt so peaceful. I was alone there and so much traffic. I, in one day I was reaching more people than I was reaching in a month as a public speaker. And there were just so many cars, people on the side. Mm -hmm. This is Massachusetts Avenue. And what I decided to do was, you're not going to silence me. I'm not going away. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I'm going this coming year, I'm taking a sabbatical. And I'm going to be going to spend quite a bit of time in Washington, D.C. Continuing to, of course, speak out and be, be you know, a part, totally committed to closing the School of the Americas. But uh, I will be there, not with a mohorn. I'm not trying to start, you know, but I'm going there. Friends probably will be joining me, coming in when they can. And I will hold those two banners up in front of the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C. I personally feel a lot of peace in making that decision. And I look forward to it. And I've got to fly you there. I've already given, I'll give it to him again. It's called uh, this documentary that's available here, Pink Smoke Over the Country. It's the vanguard of the women's ordination movement, the gender equality movement in the Catholic Church. What's it called? Pink Smoke? Pink Smoke. Amen. <laughs> and it's got many awards. It's the powerful, particular voices of these women in the movement. Nice. And, uh, yeah, they also get, you know, I give out, this is more about the School of the Americas and issue. It's also available in my journey from silence to solidarity. But there are, I know so many people have left, you know, have left 
close friends, they, in the rightfully so, they couldn't take any more. And I find it very encouraging, actually, to see a young Catholics in my own family, nieces and nephews, who simply say, oh, we love you, we support you, but the church, you know, until there's equality for women in LGBT folks and their friends, uh, they will not be a member of that church organization that would discriminate. And this is where a lot of my hope today comes from, not only folks who are very true. Just, it's harder to change often with their experiences and sort of their interrogation of, you know, their training. But, uh, so I'm staying in, in a sense, trying to, to, to speak out, closing the SOA and uh, reforming the Catholic Church. Shame. And actually, it's, it, if it does not change, I'm convinced. If it does not change, it's an op-ed I sent to the, uh, the Newsday in New York. If the Catholic Church doesn't change, it will go the way of the dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you for the yeah, nuanced and layered answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> go to Please. Um, I want to make a comment and then ask a question. And when I sort of stating the obvious, it seems that often when we speak out about injustice that is out there, even though um, the Catholic Church and those of us who are here are part of a system there, but it, it's easier to tolerate speaking out of it around injustice and people can come to us. But when we speak out about the injustice in our own community, in our own lives, in our own families, in our own organizations, when we speak out about patriarchy and, and racism and things like that, then that's where we don't get to see and I think that that's that's what I would, I would assume that, that is what I see happening within the church that it's easier to speak out against injustice when it's out there but when we have to look in the mirror and say we're the ones who are perpetuating this and it's actually connected to what is happening at the School of the Americas exactly. that rape is a part of torture that rape, patriarchy is central to a militaristic culture um, and it, but it's okay to look at it when it's out there but when it's in, when it's looking at us, we, we, it's hard to go to. So is that, and then, and then I, my, my question is, um, if you can speak at all about, um, we know, again, I work on immigrant rights for American Friends Service Committee and, and really see, obviously, the connections of what has gone on, the role that School of the Americas has played in the wars in Central America that we're seeing the legacy of today. But a piece that I don't hear talked about very much that actually Jennifer Harbury had an interview on Democracy Now! where she talked about the fact that a lot of organized crime in, uh, in El Salvador and, other, and the Northern Triangle are folks who were either trained by uh, School of the Americas, Winsick, or were trained by folks who were trained there. And so it isn't just the legacy of the war, but it's actually current folks who are antagonists who are part of a system of white people are having to flee um, and are for their own survival is connected to that. So I don't know if you have any comments about that. I'm sorry, the violence. Yeah, the violence, just the connection between, I mean, I think the legacy, the reason um, so many, we're seeing the need for so many people to migrate for simply basic survival um, because of violence in uh, the Northern Triangle, but also we're exporting also in, in Mexico itself. Uh, the, not only the legacy of the wars and that, that, but also the legacy of the training and the fact that the training has been going on to this day. Without a doubt, yes. I mean, we have, in fact, that, that was a you know, discernment process because a lot of people found it very difficult after so many years and such, so many people at the main gate to go off to the bar, U.S. Mexico bar, and we tried to um, say exactly what you think, that there's a connection between this training and the many, many years, decades of the, that military trained soldiers that we have trained in combat, uh, in oppression, how to put down, basically, when people start speaking out they need a you know, against their poverty, calling for you know food for the table, a, a living wage, and the military is there to silence that. We've seen that in so many countries, like in Bolivia and El Salvador, and then so we try to say that, that this is going on now. That there's a 
cause effect, cause or effect. <coughs> and how there's a connection. Couple, I remember talking to Jennifer Horbury about that too, about how economic policies separate from the actual training of the military, the power <coughs> and the input of the economic policies really rooted in exploitation of the cheap labor in the conscious resources. In that, um, and I, I remember when we made delegations there to the Honduras and El Salvador, our so much delegations in other countries, we, those who, oh, we came to something that was so basic that, you know, I would say this to my own family and resenting friends, if, if you and I lived in El Salvador, Honduras and other countries and experienced walked in their shoes and experienced their day, the daily lives of the people there, we would be doing what they're doing. We would want to live. We would want our children to live. It, it's about, I said before, you might want to choose life so that we live. Um, and I moved out, but again, once so many people the cruelty that's coming from our president and so many of our leaders in Washington. I, 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 they've never been there. If they go, they're going to be at our embassy there talking, you know, with their friends. But I, I, think, I, think, I think that's why our work is so important, especially now. And why it was so important for us to go to the border to join our voices with so many, with so many. And that's why we're going to be back well, this year, back at Fort Benning, but this following year, back at the border. But thank you. Thank you. When, when was Jennifer Harberry on Democracy Now? It was, a, it was about a year ago or so. Is that right? Yeah, yeah it was a lot. And it was, it's, I just think that specific piece, like the legacy of the wars is talked about, but the folks are who are criminal rings, who are very tied with a lot of the current governments, that they had direct links with SOA um, is not talked about very much. So I highly and, recommend that. Interview. And wasn't Jennifer uh, one of the awardees for our Global Peace yeah. and Justice Award? Yes, yeah. she was. Yeah. We, we have good people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jennifer is special. She's, she's special. Uh, and please, please comments, questions. Yeah. Would you uh, want to say a little bit about Venezuela and the worsening situation there? I'm very concerned about it. You know, it's really a very, very serious situation now. It's so different from Venezuela that we went to years ago in Chavez. Who said they have a lot of connections in Washington? Those, um, when we went there on a number of occasions, the delegations from our movement, it was one of those countries that was giving us so much hope. And how those huge um, oil reserves there, petroleum, was really being used to get to the port. To get to the port. And how that upset, of course, um, the, the wealthy folks, and how many of them fled. But it was so good to see people in the barrios feeling hope. Those who were so marginalized for so many years, living in poverty and struggle. And it, it, we were just so happy when we met, um, when we met with the Chinese. And I have to really explain to much about why he knew or convince him why David Lynch, actually he was not aware that Venezuela and his soldiers were at the school of the United States. His own, own military were keeping in front of him. He just, with us at the meeting, called his defense minister, how many were there, how long they've been going. He said, they're coming back. And then something happened, as you know, I mean, 
and was so say he died of cancer. And was such a charismatic person, was such a leader for his people. We loved him dearly. And then the rest of the, you know, came in and um, but our country was always there, always there. Trying to underline that revolutionary spirit and process. Always trying to um, defeat the revolution. Threat and light as it continued to spread in other countries like Bolivia. That, that Bolivian dictator was replaced by uh, Evo Morales, uh, we met with, right? That was special to going out the troops after so many years of a dictatorship there. But right now, as we know, I, I rely on other people right now to get what's going on. Lisa Sullivan, a dear friend, who was our uncle coordinator of the delegations who has been living in Venezuela for 30 years and um, knows that reality very well. And what, what I keep hearing, of course, and what I see on you, our country is once again really, really, really trying to, um, as you know, get Maduro out of office. Guaido, who claims to be president, he was not elected president. There is a lot of poverty, a lot of hunger. But with so many of our people, and people in our movement, and our friends in, in Venezuela, the U.S., stay out, keep your hands off of Venezuela. So that is not the plan of um, Secretary of State or Trump uh, or Elliot Abrams uh, or John Bolton. And it's, it's serious. Uh, but, Rebecca and I were talking, and it seems like right now, and I, I must say, there is some criticism by many of our supporters who support him that he is not the man. He needs to be very critical, very critical, and others who know the situation of the here, they live there. That it's not that. Um, He's got a lot of work to do. There's still, there's a lot of hunger. And he's just lost 20 pounds. Uh, so many are fleeing because they're hungry. And that, there's a problem. Uh, there is a problem. But the, 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 the solution, of course, is not the United States to go in there and, and do what the world has done. Is to, destroy that revolution every day the growth of the people there. But in the news we saw in the news tonight and just today that they don't have right now the military there is supporting my people there now joining the opposition police. Has there been any discussion <laughs> of how we could take people into our homes or sponsor them when they come to the border? I mean, would this be something that could be done to oh. take people in? No, to provide sanctuary in our homes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't, I personally don't know. I know I would have to really watch. I'm not in a position to, to do argument. But that is very, I mean, I, I thought about, you know, actually going to the border mm -hmm. to try to at least work there for you know, a few months. but. It seems like I do know that so many are leaving. It, some have relatives here, and some don't. Mm -hmm. In the places where they are temporarily there, they're just filled to capacity. But this would be a one I, I think a very important thing to look into. But I do believe there are many people who would want to take it. Sure. Well. I know it's. I will take one more question, and then, uh, and then we're, you can have an informal conversation, or you know, in the official part of the evening. Uh, but we want to thank everyone that made it tonight. Thank Father Roy for have, uh, being here tonight and reminding us about the movement. Remind you that we are going to go back to Fort Benning this year for the 30th anniversary, but we will be back at the border. We have a commitment that the movement has asked to be at the border to find those links and to remind us of the links between 
uh, our policies and the U.S. policies against Latin America, the training of the military, and our responsibility to uh, the folks and what they create, uh, the poverty that, that we are responsible for creating in Latin America, and that we as a movement can bring awareness to it and try to change it. Um, so we will be back at the border um, next year, uh, maybe as soon as the spring, uh, but right now we thought it would be very important to go back for those folks that, that, that would learn about the historical memory of what uh, is happening in, uh, in Georgia and the links uh, of our work. So thank you very much. We'll take one more question. Thank you, Father Roy for your dedication and your commitment to speak out against the injustice and violence and oppression. And what you were sharing reminded me of, uh, could you share about our dollars are funding the injustice and atrocities clear across Central America and South America, but we're also doing that in, uh, in Palestine. Our, at the tune of $4 billion a year, every year, $10 million every day, funding Israel, not counting the war, war uh, equipment that we're giving them. So I'm wondering if, uh, plus now we're talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, all those military interventions that have been going on and on. Again, it's the same policy, the same U.S. foreign policy of intervention and injustice. So I'm wondering if you or your organization is working in solidarity with Palestinian cause or other liberation causes in the Middle East? Yeah, Krishna, I must say with our limited resources, but I'm happy to say that a number of follow-up people in the movement who have been in the movement for our old times, many of them have gone on delegations to Palestine, especially in friends, especially California, New York, um, and many some of us like uh, Kathy Kelly, who um, so they didn't say, oh, a can that sort of, you know, a, they should have started a movement, but Kathy Kelly was with us in the early days, and she just started getting really involved, as you know, in Iraq. And I've been there with her and others from our movement, Team Rock, delegations to Iraq. <coughs> that was before the war. And, um, but I, I do know, no, no, this is me, this is a big issue, as you mentioned. Palestinian situation that's going on, um, you know, foreign policy there and elsewhere in the Middle East. Yeah, I, I just know that I personally haven't done this much, perhaps, but I'm happy to say that many of them are really working very hard in solidarity with those events. But thanks for being here. Uh, I just want to mention those resources are available that I mentioned there. The pink smoke over the Vatican. We might have given any Catholic friends. <laughs> I've sent a couple to Pope Francis. <laughs> I'm still waiting for a response. Uh, it's a great birthday gift <laughs> for a bishop or a priest. You might have a daughter. I actually sent this to every Catholic bishop in the U.S. <laughs> Seven of them, like 350 out of them, seven of them. Oh, okay. That's pretty good. <laughs> but, but, anyway, but I just want to say in closing how much I'm sorry. Maybe I was looking for them when they told me that I would be coming to see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 